morning. Good morning. We have a special day here today. We're going to recognize the school staff and the students and, the, and all the ones that work at school. And uh, Miss Anna's going to come and do that. Good morning. morning. Today we would like to recognize those in our church family who work in the school system here or in a nearby town. So as I call your name, will you please come up here and tell us where you work and what your job is. We have a small gift for each one that Madonna's going to hand you. And um, one of the things in your bag is a mug. Now, not a cup, but a mug. I felt like you were going to need lots of caffeine for the first time. When I started teaching a long time ago, all I had to worry about was teaching my kids. But these teachers this year, Carrie was telling me some of her students do not speak English. And of course, COVID. So I feel like they're, they have three things to do while I had only one. So we need to pray for them and pray hard for them. Okay, school personnel, Carrie Dean. Okay, Carrie, where do you work? I teach at Day Queen Elementary, fifth grade literacy. Okay, and you are the one that has several, they cannot speak. Yeah, I have two NES, which are non-English speakers, two ESL, which means they, English is their second language, so I've got four total. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Julia Shanks. Where do you work? I work at Empire High School and Elementary School, and I teach music and art. All right. Thank you, Julia. Kathy Gilbert. I work here at Derrick's High School. I work in cafeteria, cook. We love to cook for kids. So, when you're hungry, come see us. Thank <laughs> you, Lisa Ward. Where do you work, Lisa? I work here at Derrick's at the elementary school. I'm a paraprofessional. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, Courtney Hankins. First grade at Deep Queen Primary. First grade. Yes. Special teacher. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. And David Bennett. And David, where are you this year? I'm at Mental Springs High School and I'm the athletic director. All right. You've got a lot of work to do. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, we also had Brooke Toy, that's a teacher, and she has had sick children, and her mother is sick this week, so she couldn't be here today. Um, thank you all, school teachers. We will be praying for you. And next, we want to recognize our Sunday school teachers for our children and youth. Janice Hill. Come on, Janice. <laughs> Janice is here every Sunday, ready to teach those who are getting ready to go to school. Right? That's right. Thank you, Janice. Mm -hmm. Then Carrie Dinger, just stand up, Carrie. Uh, she teaches in our children's area. Uh, and Kathy Gilbert, Kathy, we've already recognized them. And Brenda Griffin. Brenda. <laughs> Brenda loves the little girls that she teaches in the upper grades in three through six. Three through six. Yes, thank you, Brenda. And then for our youth, we have Tiffany and Adam Smith. Since he's working. All right. Our Sunday school teachers made 
back to school goodie bags for all of our children and gave them to them in Sunday school this morning. So they are such good workers and I appreciate them so much. And school teachers, thank you so much for all of the work you do to impact the lives of so many precious children. And Brother John is going to come and pray for our teachers and our students. If you're a student, will you stand while Brother John has his prayer? If you're a student, come on guys, stand up. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for a new school year just about to start. We thank you for these students, and I pray for their lives. I pray, Lord, that in these wonderful formative years of theirs, that indelible impressions will be made upon their lives that will affect them forever for the kingdom's good. We thank you, Lord, for these teachers, staff members, that make school a wonderful experience. We pray your blessings on them. We pray for safety for all the respective campuses. That Lord, you would just put a bubble of protection over the faculty, the staff, the students, that no harm would come to them in any way. We pray, Father, for a good atmosphere for learning and just good fellowship among all who are concerned. We ask, Lord God, that you will just bless this year as unique challenges have presented themselves. Lord, just give people grace to be able to accomplish that which you put before them. And Lord, may it be a great year, and we trust it into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Let me make a few quick announcements. Uh, we have a pastor's search committee meeting this afternoon at 530. Ladies' prayer meeting tomorrow night, 7 p.m. at home in Janice Hill. And men's prayer meeting Tuesday night out here in the Fellowship Hall. And uh, on the back of your bulletin, there's just all kinds of people's names in need of prayers. And let's be faithful to pray for them. And next Sunday morning, we're going to have a baptism. So you don't want to be here for that. Mike? Good morning. Good morning. Back to the whole way of doing things. Gary's not here, so we can do it the way we want to, huh? <laughs> Let's stand as we turn to number four, to God be the glory. If you want to turn to him.
mind staying up here and making sure I stay on track. So, uh, <laughs> our next one is uh, to uh, send a great revival. That's what we need. Amen. Amen. Send a great revival. Four sixty. Sixty-nine. Revive us again. Amen. Sticking on them revival songs this morning. <laughs> Let's stand as we sing. First, second, fourth verse.
Bless us with Lord. We pray you bless this offer. Help us to spread the word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Children, you would follow Brittany to Children's Church. Good morning. It's good to be here with you today. You do my heart good and uh, look forward to getting over here all week long to talk about Ishbi Banab. Don't you love biblical names? Uh, you know, we always, we named all four of our kids uh, biblical names. I have a Matthew. I have a Rebecca with the Old Testament spelling of B-E-K-A-H. And I have a Nathan and a Stephen. And I don't know what we were going to do after, if we got beyond four. Uh, I thought about Mayhir Shalal Hashbaz. Uh, but I found out that that word means rot. So I don't think that would be a real good name. Ishbi Vinab is an interesting name and an interesting person, although we know very little about him other than the fact that he was a great big man. We're in a series of messages now talking about dealing with our giants. And if you remember from last week, our uh, story was David and Goliath. Now this morning we're going to be in 2 Samuel 21, if you want to go ahead and start turning there. If you'll remember, David went down to the, the, the brook there in the Valley of Elah, and he picked up five smooth stones. Why did he pick up five? Because David was going to face more than one giant in his life. David was going to face five literal giants in his life. He was going to face Goliath, of course. He was going to face uh, Goliath's kinfolks, Ishbibanab, Saf, Lami, and the last one, and certainly to me one of the most frightening of all, was a giant that his name is not listed in the scripture, but he had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. And David faced these giants 
throughout different periods of his life. There's something you need to understand. You don't outgrow problems in life. They just take on a different form, right? Uh, used to, my problem was getting my hair to lay down. Now it's to keep from getting my head sunburned. You know, problems present themselves in different ways. And David is older now in life. And you would think, well, my goodness, he's, he's past his prime years. He's, he's past his younger years. You would think everything would be smooth sailing. But can I tell you this as a believer in Christ? Satan never lets up. Satan never backs down. And he may present you with a certain set of issues and problems when you're younger, but let me tell you something. He's got a whole different set of them set, set aside for your middle years, and he's got another set of problems and issues set aside for your elder years as well. And so he never gives up as long as we draw a breath. He always comes at us with different things. Now in 2 Samuel 21, Beginning at verse 15, I'd like to read three verses there. It says, When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then Ishbibanab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. When then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall not go any more with us into battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Now why were these giants coming after David? Why were they coming after the people of Israel? Well, let me tell you this. Biblically speaking, uh, our Messiah, Jesus, is from the lineage of David. He is from the nation of Israel. And Satan knew that. See, Satan knows scripture better than you do. I mean, he can quote it. He knows it backward and forward, and he's threatened by it. And he understood this, if he could just nip off, nip in the bud, the, uh, the lineage, then he would cut off the possibility of Messiah coming forth. Of course, he really doesn't understand the nature of God because God's not gonna allow that to take place. But here we are once again in a scenario of battle. David is much advanced in years by this time. He's no longer that ruddy youth with a sling in his hand and a pocket full of rocks ready to take on giants. He's a man much more matured in his age. And as he goes into battle, David becomes weary. He becomes faint and he is taken back. And this giant who is of the sons of the giant, speaking of Goliath, one of the kinsmen of, of the giant comes forth thinking that he would kill David. Now this giant's name, if you'll remember, Goliath meant, I am higher than you. And I really believe that name is representative of the problem of pride in our lives. When we get to thinking that we're more than what we really are. Ishbi Banab has a, has a unique meaning. If you go back into the language of the Philistines and understand where this, uh, this name comes from and sort of what, what the meaning of it is, it basically means this, to take captive. To take captive. You know, one of the things that I've noticed as a pastor is there are a lot of people who are bound that don't need to be bound. There are a lot of people who are in bondage that don't need to be in bondage. There are a lot of people who are held back by things that they don't need to be held back by. And, you know, uh, it's amazing how the Lord speaks sometimes. I had this scripture in front of me, and I was on my back porch the other day, and I was tired. I'd mowed a couple of yards when it was about 107 degrees outside, you know, and I was sitting back there drinking some uh, artificially sweetened tea. Now, that'll do you in a pinch, okay? I was sitting back there getting cooled off, 
And the Lord just said, okay, now this is, this is where you need to go with this because I was really pondering that thing Thursday afternoon, okay? And the Lord said, here it is. We are sometimes tormented by things from our past. Everybody here has got a past. Some of us got a longer past than others do, but everybody here has got one. And sometimes we're tormented by things from the past. You know, the oldest person I think that I ever actively counseled as a pastor was in his 90s. And he was in my office to talk to me about something that happened to him when he was 18 years of age. And so sometimes the devil can just bring things from the past that will be a problem to you. People also are held in bondage by things in their present, things that are happening right now. And sometimes people are bound by things in the future or what they think might be in their future. And that's called worry, and we're going to be dealing with that here in just a moment, okay? But let's think about this for just a moment. People deal with things in their past, and it usually manifests itself in one of two ways. It either is something that you have done or something that someone has done to you. And that's by and large what, what I hear from people when they come and say, I want to talk to you about something that happened to me way back when. You know, one of the things that we need to understand is that when God forgives, God forgives. A lot of people come and say, well, you know, I had this sin in my life. It was back when I was, was very young and I was very foolish and I... I allowed myself to get involved in, in this or allowed myself to get involved in that. And, uh, you know, Pastor, I, I, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, but that is still bothering me. You know what? It may be bothering you, but it doesn't have to be bothering you. First of all, you need to understand who is it that's bringing it up in the first place? It's not God. You know what God said to us when he forgave us? He said, your sin I will remember no more. How about that? You know, it's not that God's getting old and his memory's going on him. Amen? It's just that he chooses not to remember certain things. When one of my, when my sons got grown, he, he came to me and he said, Pop, he said, I'm, I'm sorry about all the trouble that I caused you. And you know what I did? It did me, did me the world, a world of good, and I know it did him a world of good, too. I looked at him, and I said, ha, what trouble? What problems? That's not what I'm going to choose to remember. And you know what? That's not what God chooses to remember about us. If we have come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have sought him with our whole heart, and we have asked him to come into our life and forgive us our sin. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that he cleanses us from all sin. All sin. And you know what the devil really loves for you to do? He loves for you to keep paying for something that's already been paid for. Thinking about that for just a moment. What is, what is guilt in the Christian's life more than Satan trying to make you pay for something that's already been paid for. I remember I had a bunch of medical bills once upon a time, and I was paying them off just as quickly as I could, starting with the smallest, and then I'd double up on the next one, and I'd double up on the next one, and trying to get them all knocked out. And I kept getting this bill from, it was either a clinic or a laboratory, I can't remember. It wasn't for all that much money, but I was trying to make good on all the, all the outstanding bills that I had. And uh, so I kept getting this bill from this place that I knew in my check register, it said that I had written a check for and paid. And I went back and found the corresponding bank statement. I found the canceled check where I had paid that. And so I called and called till I finally got a human being, you know. And then once you get a human being, you got to find somebody that speaks Arkansas. Amen. And I finally got someone who understood Arkansas, and I said, look, I've got this problem. I keep getting this bill from you for something that I have proof and evidence that I have already paid or this is already taken care of. What can I do? And they said, well, 
take a picture of the cancel check, both sides, and email it to this address. And I did with an explanation, and you know what? I didn't get any more bills. Because that cancel check was proof that the payment had been made for that debt. Let me tell you something, dear Christian friend. The payment has been made for your debt. When Jesus on the cross stretched out his hands and died and cried, it is finished, he said this word, tetelestai, which means paid in full. And your debt has been paid. And you know what? If Satan's bringing it up, it's just, it's not because you're guilty. It's because he's desperate. And he's trying to wreak havoc in your life. And so the next time that the devil comes around to you and says, yeah, just remember what you used to be. You just remind him what his future is going to be and he'll hush. Amen. Because... You don't have to worry about that anymore. You say, well, well, maybe it's not something that I did, but it's something that someone did to me. You know, you can choose in life. I really believe this. You choose what is going to define your life. And you can be a victim or you can be a victor. And I'm not saying that as a cheesy uh, phrase or, or some kind of little catchphrase. I'm saying that that's a decision that you have to make. First of all, there's not a single person in this room here today that has not had somebody do something to them that was unpleasant. Everybody's had that. And you know what? If you let that be the defining factor of your life for the rest of your days, you're going to live and you're going to die a very miserable individual. One of the things that we have to do, at least do this, Come to the place where that doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't define who you are. You know, the great thing about it is I wake up every morning and I have a great deal of say-so and what kind of person I'm going to be that day. And what happened yesterday, what happened a year ago, what happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and a whole lot more than that ago. <laughs> I, that, that can either be the dominating factor of my day or it can be something that doesn't matter how I live this particular day that I'm in. And if you want to get right down to brass tacks, here's the deal. Someone who's wronged me, I really have the obligation before God to forgive that person. You say, well, what if they haven't apologized? Well, let me tell you something. Some of the people that wronged me are dead. <laughs> I'm not going to get an apology out of those. And some of those that are living, I'm not going to get an apology out of those either. And you know what? That's not my problem. That's their problem. My obligation before God is to let that go. Because if it is still holding me back, I am still in their power. I'm still in their clutches. And I'm still bound by it. And you know what? You can't live a joyful life if you are bound to the past you can't do that if any man be in Christ what does the scripture say he is a new creature old things are passed away and behold all things become new gives you a whole different outlook on life doesn't it so let me tell you something ladies and gentlemen we don't have to be bound by what's back there we don't have to be bound by what's back there We've got a guy that works for us at the city. And, uh, you know, I grew up in Amity. And when I came back to Amity about 32, so yeah, about 32 years ago to pastor, I saw him and he said, um, do you remember dumping me upside down in a 55 gallon trash barrel at school? Because I was a senior and he was a top water. You know what a top water is? Freshman. And I did. I said, yes, I remember that. I sure do. And I said, but you know what grieves me? Is that what you, that's what you remember about me. We're the best of friends, see each other every day. What a blessing he is to my life. And I want you to know something, folks. You can let the stuff hold you back if you want to. But you can't be joyful in the Lord and be held back at the same time. Amen. You can't do that. It doesn't work. You say, well, what about the present? 
There sure are a lot of things to, to get us all turned around in the present, aren't there? Yes. You know, uh, a lot of things can happen to Christians that don't need to happen to Christians, but do. I've known Christians that have had addictions. Okay? I've, known, I've dealt with Christians who had gambling addictions, who had drug addictions, who had addictions to pornography and things of that nature. You say, were they really Christians? I believe so. I believe so. The thing about it is you can't be a joyful Christian if you're bound. Amen. And the great thing about it is I love the old hymn that says, He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. You can be free of those things. You truly can. One of my best friends on earth is a guy that I share a birthday with. He's two years older than me. He was a truck driver. And while he was driving a truck, of course, he, he had a back injury. He had fallen down and fallen flat on a flatbed trailer and messed up his back. And he was in a lot of pain. And so he got into prescription medication. And as he was out on the road and so forth, that wasn't getting the job done. So he was getting some other things to supplement his prescription meds and became an addict. And you know what? The old boy showed up at our church one day. I took a liking to this guy. We found out we had the same birthday and he was off work for a while because of his back. And I said, can I come out and see you? And I did. I went out there and sat with him on his front porch the biggest part of the day. First real conversation that we ever had, but it lasted all day long. And you know what? He told me here just the other day, he said, I'll forever be thankful for that time we came together. He said, you came to help me realize that I didn't need the stuff that I was on. And he said, since that day on my front porch, I have not abused a single drug. Now, that wasn't me. Folks, I didn't breathe on him, put my hands on his head, or wave my coat at him. He didn't fall backwards or anything like that, but God delivered him from that. And God can deliver his people from stuff that is holding them back. He can deliver us from addictions, addictions of the body and addictions of the mind and the heart. He can certainly do that. And there are a lot of people who are wrapped up in fear right now. We're living in some frightful times, aren't we? You know, I'm... <laughs> Uh, I mean, we've got COVID. It's a real deal. You know, I don't live in fear of it. I'm one of those guys that uh, I'm, I'm not afraid of it. But at the same time, I take my precautions. I do what I need to do. And I try to be respectful of other people as, as well in, in the process of things. But I'm not going to just nail the door shut on my house and let somebody roll peas under the front door to feed me, you know. I'm, I'm going to be out there because I don't think life can totally quit. Yet, we need to be careful. Our world is not a safe place to be, is it? I'm kind of like that state trooper. <laughs> Zach, you'll love this and pull that little old lady over. And he said, ma'am, I see here that you're a, you, you, you carry a concealed weapon. She said, well, yeah, I do. She reached over there into the console and pulled out a 45. And uh, she reached over there in the, in the glove box and she had a 380 in there. And, reached under the seat and pulled out a 357 Magnum. He said, Granny, what are you afraid of? She said, not a thing in the world. <laughs> it's that kind of world though, isn't it? I mean, who would have ever thought, if you're close to my age or older, who, who, who of us would have ever thought that we would see things? I remember it was a real debate whether we locked the front door at night or not. Many a night we slept with the, with the doors open and screens might have been hooked. Boy, that was really going to keep somebody out, wasn't it? You know, I mean, uh, windows open. You know, we didn't think about it. We, we live in a very fearful world. And I, you know, Chris has been talking to me. She said, you know, we really need to take a major trip somewhere. Okay, where are you going to take me? <laughs> And uh, she said, well, first she wanted to go to Hawaii. Then she said, well, let's, let's, go, to, let's go to Scotland and Ireland. I'd, I'd love to do that. I'd take my kilt and wear it. <laughs> yeah. You know why the Scottish are so good, such good fighters? They wear wool all the time. They're aggravated. Okay? Uh, I'm sitting there going, you know what? I don't really think there's really a safe place outside these United States that I would really want to try to go right now. 
I've done a lot of that. I've been on 41 overseas trips. But I don't think I'd want to do it right now. Are you afraid? I'm cautious. It doesn't consume me, especially when I'm sitting on my back porch. I feel like that's the best place in the world anyway. But you know, folks, people are afraid. People are bound by things. People have addictions. People have things in their lives that are being difficulties to them. And you know, the thing about it is, we've got a God who's bigger than anything we face. There's nothing that cannot be overcome. There truly isn't. In fact, most of these things, Jesus is the only way. It's the only way you're ever going to overcome some of these addictions and so forth. I had a friend who was a mainliner of heroin, $1,500 a day habit back in the 1980s. Okay, that's a lot of money back in 1980. God delivered him from that. He never craved another, another drop of it, not one bit. God can do this. And what we've got to understand is our God is bigger than anything we'll ever face. In our present world right now, we can either hide behind the walls in fear or we can walk out there boldly, cautiously but boldly, and understand that uh, God's going to take care of us, and I really believe that he will. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't leave the house. But I believe it, and I believe God's going to take care of, of all of it. One of my favorite characters in history is Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson, Confederate general. First Battle of Bull Run, his whole brigade was retreating, and he was just standing there. That's where he got his name. Somebody said, look at old Jackson standing there like a stone wall. He wouldn't move. He had bullets flying by him. I think a couple of them even clipped his coattail and so forth, and he never budged. And somebody asked him, General, weren't you afraid? And his answer was something like this. My faith has taught me that I am no less in the hands of the Almighty on the battlefield as I am at home in my bed. God has fixed the day of my death, and until that comes, he will care for me. I believe that. I, I mean, you got to believe something, right? you got to believe something. You might as well believe the truth, that my God can handle anything that I've got, anything that comes against me. You know, I've I, I got some proof. Y'all see me standing here? Y'all can't hardly miss me. You know why I'm standing here? Because nothing's taken me out yet. And it's missed some good opportunities. You know why I'm here? Because God deemed that I should be here. God deemed that I should survive those things and go through them. You know what? Might have made me a little stronger. Might have made me a whole lot wiser. But it didn't have the results that Satan wanted in my life. It didn't take me out. And I want to tell you something, dear friend. If you're struggling today, let me give you some encouragement. Our God, he's God. He's bigger than anything we face. He's stronger than anything that comes against us. And he gives us grace for the journey. Amen. And how wonderful it is to know that he does that. And some people, some people, some people are bound by the future. You know what we do when we worry about the future? We mortgage our tomorrow. We do. We mortgage our tomorrow. I'm scared of what's going to happen. Well, what if it doesn't? Right? I think it was Benjamin Franklin that said something like this. He said about 90% of the stuff that I worried about never happened, and the other 10% I couldn't do anything about. So why worry about that? Uh, I had this wonderful dear brother there in the church at Amity, Brother Tommy Webb. He was one of those guys who was about this tall, and he was just about that wide, too. And I loved running around with him because when we went to Little Rock, his pickup would automatically pull into Brown's Country Store up there, you know. He said, there's something wrong with the steering here. It just keeps wanting to go. And, and I guarantee you, that guy could build a plate like nobody else. But he had the best attitude about life. The best attitude about life. And when we would be together and 
I'd get out of the truck or he'd get out of my, my rig and, and he'd say, well, John, I'll see you if something don't get me. And if it does, it'll bring me back when it gets to be daylight. Let me ask you this. If God is our God and Jesus is our Savior and we're inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? The Bible says don't fear what men can do to you. <laughs> men are always going to be what people are. They're going to sometimes do you dirty and things are going to happen. You know what? You can't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, my wife is always telling me when I leave, uh, she said, first of all, don't you ever leave the house without kissing me goodbye. I said, well, I'm all up for that. I think I'll go some more. I said, let me ask you, that. why, why do you want me to do it? She said, I never know if it's going to be the last time you're going to kiss me. I said, well, okay. Hook her up, hon. <laughs> Maybe one of these days it may be the last time. The thing about it is, folks, I can't live in fear of what I cannot see. I trust in the one I cannot see. Yet I know he is there beyond any shadow of doubt. Do you know that all the days of my past, this, you're going to say, man, he's real smart. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> all the days of my past used to be my tomorrows. And I made it through those. Sometimes I didn't know how I would. There are times I thought I was going to die myself. There were times my heart was so broken and my tears flowed in such a steady stream that I did not know if I would make it through the night. But I'd wake up in the middle of the night and God would just somehow whisper out of the darkness, I'm still here, son, and so are you. And I'd wake up and it'd be the sun shining once more. And you know... That's the way he is. And if I can trust him to take care of everything that is behind me, not only what I have done, but what other people have done as well to me. If I can trust him with that, if I can trust him with today, and anymore when you get on the highway, you're taking your life into your own hands. Have y'all noticed people don't drive like they used to? That yellow line down the middle of the road used to mean something, but it doesn't mean much anymore, right? I mean, seriously, you never know. The thing about it is, I got here today. You know, I'll be here this evening, Lord willing. If he's not, I probably won't make it. <laughs> but I'll probably be here, you know. If he can handle the things of yesterday, if he can handle the things of today, I believe he's got tomorrow. I believe he does. I believe he does. The old song says, I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, though its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry over the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today he walks beside me, for he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow. I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. It's going to be all right. I said it's going to be all right. Yeah, it's going to be all right. Why? Because I'm his not only for time, but I'm his for eternity. You know, there's, there's a couple of things that are true about my future and yours as believers. One is we're going to reach the end of our life someday if the Lord doesn't come before then. 
we don't get if we don't get raptured out of here we're we're probably going to die now some people look at that as a sad sad thing i don't i can't i can't i know what life does to people but i know what it's going to do for me when i come to the end of my life it's going to set me free i'm his and you know what? If I die, he's going to be there to welcome me. And if he comes and gets me, all the more better. Because I know where I'm going to be. And I know what I'm going to enjoy. And I know what the blessings of that are going to be. And how in the world can I be upset about a future like that? <laughs> Hallelujah. It's good, folks. And you know, here's the thing. Satan does all this to steal our joy. If he can get us all worried, fretful, bound up, guilty, feeling awful because of what people have done to us, then we take our eyes off the prize and we put our eyes on this stuff. But if you keep your eyes on him, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who's at the finish line waiting for us it's going to be alright Ishbi Banab came with his spear and his new sword the reason he had a new sword his uncle Goliath or his dad or whoever Goliath was to him David had taken it he had a new sword he was going to do David in and you know what God had other plans for David and God intervened for David. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this. You may not see it now. You hold on, believer. You hold on, child of God. God will intervene for you. God will take care of you. God will bless you. God will give you grace. God will give you strength. And he and Satan can't steal the victory that is ours in Christ. He can't. What we've got to do is learn how to walk by trust. Learn how to walk by faith. Learn how to live in the reality. Not of what used to be, not of what's going on now, not of what might be, but in the reality of who he is and who I am in him. Whew. If I wasn't so fat, I'd run up and down this aisle. <laughs> oh, folks, listen. The victory is ours. Let's live it. Let's live it. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, I want to invite you to find out what he's like. I'd like nothing more this morning than to just get with you and introduce you to Jesus. And let you find out for yourself what Christ can do for you. He can forgive you. He can give you hope. He can give you confidence. He can give you joy in the midst of all that's going on. Yes, he can. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian and you're struggling with some of these things, struggling is not against God's law. Letting those things win may be. You know what? We don't have to let them win. We can, God can give us the victory. In fact, he already has. We just need to live in the reality of the victory that is ours now. So, once claim that. If you're looking for a church home, I know a good one. Right here. Good folks seeking after God. It'd be a good place for you to be. Let's bow together and pray. Father, I want to ask you to move here this morning in the hearts of people and let them know just all that is theirs because of Christ. Father, you laid all of our sin upon the Savior and he died to take our sin from us. And we don't have to deal with that anymore. We don't struggle with it. It's something that you have dealt with eternally. Lord, help us turn loose of 
things of the past that hold us back. Help us not to look at the present, Lord, with, with uh, anguish and, 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 and heartache in our hearts, but help us to understand that this is the moment we're alive and these are good days for us. Even no matter what the world is doing, Father, it can't affect the heart of the believer. And Lord, help us not to fret over the future. How foolish that would be to spend our tomorrows worrying about tomorrow and come down to where we have no more tomorrows left and all we've done is, is fret. God, help us to trust. Help us to believe. Help us to lean on. Help us to rely on you. And Lord, may you move here this morning in the hearts of those who need to make decisions. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together, please.